we're gathered here today for a Facebook Live and we're on several other platforms as well. I'll list those in a minute to speak to you about what you should consider if you're trying to decide if you should travel or not um, internationally. Uh, WHO has a mandate to help people understand, to help countries understand what the risks are relative to international travel and that's what we'll speak with you about today. My name is Nika Alexander. I'm with the media relations team, the communications team here at WHO. And I have two people with me to talk with you about this subject. One is Dr. Nedret Emirolu. She heads um, the group that looks at country readiness, how countries prepare to manage emergencies. And also Dr. Carmen Dolea at the far end, who's the head of the IHR secretariat. IHR is the International Health Regulations. It's one of two global mandates, global agreements about health. And it's what gives WHO a lot of its uh, marching orders, what we should do around emergencies and around travel and trade as well. So today we're going to, today we're seven months into this outbreak. We're six months since WHO declared this a global emergency, a public health emergency of international concern. Some countries, the situation is getting worse. Some countries it's stabilized and in others it's gotten better. And people are starting to think about whether or not they can make a choice to travel. So to talk about that, I'll turn first to uh, Carmen. Um, Carmen, I said off the top that this is about choices, um, that, that it's not, there's no mandate that people must move around, although sometimes people have personal mandates that they need to move around. So what's the first thing people need to think about when they're contemplating whether or not they should undertake an international travel voyage? Thanks very much, Nika, and uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Um, the first thing to know is that sick people and people that are contacts of a confirmed case of COVID should not travel. That's one thing. The other thing is people that are elderly or uh, have underlying health conditions, uh, they should postpone travel, particularly in areas with uh, intense community transmission. Um, we also defined in our recent guidelines what it means of essential travel, because with all these restrictions, we, there must continue some essential travel for humanitarian and emergency response, for cargo operations, um, diplomats, seafarers, and a, a group of people that are really have to travel. Even for people that choose to travel, there are certain precautions that people should continue to take uh, while traveling. First of all, the precautions for a respiratory transmitted virus. Uh, make sure that uh, you keep your distance, make sure that you uh, practice uh, coughing etiquette, you cough into your, your elbow or your sneeze or in a tissue that you, you dispose of. Um, wear a mask, uh, particularly in areas where there's uh, crowded uh, uh, situations and uh, uh, follow the instructions or the measures that are in place by the national authorities when you decide to travel. And then people need to make their own decisions looking at uh, what would be their exposure in the areas where they want to travel, what would be the intensity of exposure, what's the transmission patterns in the area where they, where they travel, uh, what is the duration of potential contacts with people that may be sick, uh, and what are the, uh, the measures that they can do to, pro to continue to protect themselves. Okay. I don't know There's if Medret wants to, uh, to, to jump in. Yeah. Um, just, that's actually a lot of information yeah. to digest. <laughs> exactly. we're, going to, we're going to piece it up a little bit. We will yeah. chunk it out, and that's the, but that's the broad scope of what we'll be talking about today. So just to chunk that out a little bit, one of the first things you said off the top is that if somebody is elderly, they should not travel. How do we define what's elderly? I think people might be surprised when you give the, the actual number, the age. Nika, maybe I should start with the first steps. It's, it's the same approach as we suggest to uh, control the epidemic at the local level. So the risk assessment and risk management. And that's, that's the kind of information we would like the individuals to carefully assess their situation. Do you need to travel? Do you take the risk if there is a risk to travel? Uh, what is your own conditions? What is the epidemiology in the country that you are living or you are currently and where you are going? Uh, what is, is an essential uh, WHO advice is to protect the high risk groups. And those high risk groups are the same as within the uh, transmission that we define over 65 years of age, unless the country defines it differently, and then anyone with the underlying conditions, which we know already, diabetes, cancer, chronic conditions, uh, some of the chronic diseases, uh, that they should be protected as 
highest uh, level of uh, risks, and then they should consider to avoid or to postpone their travel. But of course, at the end, if they really need to travel, uh, that will be their own risk assessment and judgment. So in a way, it depends on where you're going from and yes. where you're going to. And who you are, what your and who situation you are, is. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so uh, at the top as well, you said if you're a contact, of course, if you're sick, you should not travel. That seems a very common sense one. And if you're the contact of someone, the way you would know if you're a contact in some countries, you would, have, you would be in a contact tracing sort of environment. Their health officials would be following up with you. You would know that you have been in contact with someone who is a confirmed case. So that's a way of knowing that you are a contact. In some other places, it might not be as clear to know whether or not you're a contact. But um, that's the guidance anyways. If you are a contact, you should also not travel. Um, so uh, you spoke about, we spoke about the choice of whether or not to travel. Let's say you must undertake some essential travel or you're one of those essential workers. What some of the measures you should think about um, as you're heading first to the, the, the airport or the train station where you will undertake that travel from, what can you do to protect yourself while you're in that first hub in, the, in your voyage? I would like to do that one, Carmen. Okay, so I, I can start again. Um, so planning your journey, um, you, you'd either have to go to the airplane, uh, to the airport in, in a public transport or in your own car and so on and so forth. Protect yourself even in the public transport. In some places, uh, you need to wear a mask to protect yourself and protect others. Use hand sanitizer if you need to or wash your hands uh, properly. When you arrive at the airport, there are many airports now that begin to open for travel and they have put in place measures particularly to, to support uh, the resumption of travel, uh, which means um, distancing, physical distancing, when you go to the check-in, when you go to, to the security areas. Uh, in some airport, you, you are required to wear a mask as you go through the security or you go through the, the check-in. Um, airports and airlines uh, favor uh, online check-in or limiting the contact with the ground crew so that limiting the exposure the potential exposure um, and all these measures that you'd see signage in the airport that that uh, tells you where to go how to go how to keep the distance how to make sure that you you're not in contact with with people uh, and really all of these measures that we keep saying of uh, physical distancing um, uh, increase the, the the number of station for hand sanitizer or the increase the uh, disinfection disinfection at the airports uh, and the, all of the areas particularly in the contact with the with the ground cr crew um, all to the uh, to the point where you embark and uh, even on embarkation and disembarkation there are measures now to uh, stagger the uh, uh, onboarding and the uh, disembarkation so that we keep the, the physical distancing that, that protects uh, people um, going on on a travel so that we can resume safely. Thank you. I'll just I think Carmen really <laughs> covered comprehensively, but as a summary, my message is do what you always do to prevent from getting mm. infected. I mean, it's the same thing. With There's nothing special telling, about no. travel in a way. But do it all. Mm. Do not do one yeah. and only. I mean, hygiene and, and hand washing, looking into the physical distance. If you're in a crowd face, it, and if possible, using a mask uh, or, or a face covering and trying to really uh, keep away from, from the population, the crowd, so those are all the general principles we have been giving over and over, where like Mike has been really, or, or Maria has been telling that continuously during the press briefings, and that's always the WHO message. Yeah, it's almost a hashtag do it all kind of idea that you, it's, there's a, a exactly. menu of things that are important to do that will protect you. Now you mentioned masks, and I know when we do our press conferences, Sometimes people in the comments ask us, why aren't we wearing masks? Might even ask us now why we're not wearing masks. We're practicing the first thing in that list of do it all, which is the physical distancing. We're over a meter apart, and that's WHO's advice, where possible to stay at least a meter apart from other people. Um, and if it's not possible, as, uh, as Carmen mentioned over the top, if you're closer because you're in a close setting, then you would you'd be advised to wear um, a cloth face covering or a medical mask if you are uh, somebody in the at-risk group that we mentioned off the top. Um, so we are on LinkedIn. 
Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, and YouTube at the moment. If you have questions for us, because that's the point of, a, of one of these live events, if you have questions for us on Twitter, you use hashtag AskWHO, A-S-K-W-H-O. That's how you put, give us your questions on Twitter. Otherwise, put your questions in the comment section, and we have several colleagues um, across each of the, the platforms looking for your questions so they can put them to us. So we have one now. Actually, we have more than one now, but let me get at the first one. Uh, Mario uh, Frontado is asking what is the possibility of some kind of a, a travel certificate or an immunity passport or some kind of certification exactly. that would in a way show that you have immunity. Um, there's some, some um, questions around how effective that kind of a certificate is, and so WHO does have some advice around that. Okay. Yes, we do. I will ask Carmen to start <laughs> to take and that one. Yeah. we will have a teamwork and I will sure. supplement as needed. Yeah. Thank you very much. This is really a good question that we, uh, we receive uh, often. And as uh, Nika was mentioning, we did have uh, published uh, a scientific brief uh, highlighting the, the science behind the immunity of COVID-19, which says that for the moment, uh, even if we are so late, despite the research that we have done, we still don't know exactly how the immunity develops after, after uh, how, uh, you know, how many anticorps, what type of antibodies, what type of things, uh, at uh, what distance from being infected. So the science behind it, it's still being uncovered. That's why we do not recommend currently using an immunity certificate, as we say. And these immunity tests would, would, uh, would uh, analyze your body or, or your, your blood type, to, blood, blood, to say if you got the disease, if you were already infected. And there are other types of, of, uh, of tests that we are doing, of course, the ones that uh, show whether you are infected or not. This is a diagnostic PCR test. And um, some, we know that some countries are asking uh, this testing prior to departure. And also with this, we, in our recent guidance, we also mentioned that even if you had had the test um, uh, two days, three days, four days, five days before your travel, you still are uh, at risk of being exposed between the moment that you took the test and the moment that you travel. So all of this testing, we really need to be, um, to continue to follow the science, the development of the scientific knowledge around uh, the immunity development, the fiability and the reliability um, uh, of the test that we are, we are using, the extent to which we can use this test uh, at the point of care, at the departure in the airport and so on. We are learning, we are in discussions with, with partners and with networks of people to uh, build our understanding so that we can provide the, the evidence-based advice to, to uh, travelers and to countries. I don't know if you uh, want to supplement. I think you covered really <laughs> well all the health, public health aspects, but also we have concerns related to some human rights, data protection, and sort of uh, use of those certificates. That's another reason. Mm. And the message I want to give is that we are following the scientific evidence and, and very carefully. And of course, we will update as we have. Uh, more information, but that's uh, that's WHO's position at this point of time. And if I may add one thing about it, because the question will probably come, or it did come again, the correlation with the yellow fever uh, vaccination certificate, and also would like to use the opportunity to clarify this, that the yellow fever card uh, is a proof that somebody has been vaccinated against yellow fever. It's not a proof of that person has developed immunity or not. And that's always the confusion between this immunity certificate and yellow fever vaccination certificate. For the moment, you, we don't have a vaccine for COVID-19, so the uh, certification can only prove whether the person got the vaccine or not. It cannot show whether the person has developed immunity. And I just wanted to clarify this because there's always a confusion between these two types of certificates. There's um, a few questions on uh, when and where and how I should be tested and how many days and so on. Um, some of it is really dependent on what your national authorities ask of you. WHO provides guidance to governments, but then the governments will have their own recommendations as to when you should be tested or retested, how soon before travel you need to have taken your test. So some of those uh, are not really on our plate to be able to answer. Um, some people are asking, this isn't exactly uh, our, our uh, specialization, for this exact group, but around the quality of the air in an airplane. We recently did an update uh, Q&A question and answer 
on um, air quality and on ventilation. And we did mention on airplanes, but Carmen, I think we were speaking about this just before as well. So people want to know what's the quality of the air in an airplane and can I get sick from the air in an airplane? So Carmen, yeah, over to thanks you. very much, Nika. Yes, indeed, we, we were just talking about that. And uh, I mentioned we are in discussion with our partners in the aviation sector and uh, we know from them that many of the modern jets um, have uh, a system of recirculating the air in the aircraft and these jets which have the circulation of, of the air they are provided with a HEPA filter that blocks certain uh, uh, small particles um, uh, in that um, and these are many of the modern jets but there are some older planes that do not have this recirculation system in the plane which which do not have the HEPA filters as we call them uh, so that's what we gain from as knowledge from our partners in the aviation sector and we continue to discuss with them to get more insights into the developments of the technology for, for all these aircraft. I think um, to summarize what you had said off the top, um, the air in airplanes, simply put, mm. is actually relatively clean, as it were, because mm. it's filtered regularly in most airplanes that most mm. people will mm. be traveling on for international travel, yeah. which is what we're speaking about. I think the concern people have is whether it is circulating yes. the same air. Yes. And, and to our knowledge, uh, even though it's not our, our technical expertise, of course, but we work very closely with the UN agencies and other partners in travel sector. And we have been assured that uh, the new filters are not going to be circulating the same air, but it will go it through the filters. It filters the air before exactly. it comes through, yeah. And then also we, we, we work very closely with them uh, and we advise on the public health measures but also they take care of the infrastructure that is uh, like at the airports, at the aircrafts, uh, embarking, disbarking, you know, luggage, and all these services are also assured that they are going to risk uh, the minimum uh, or decrease the risk to the minimum on transmitting the disease during travel. We're asked a few questions are about what happens when I arrive in the destination country. What does WHO recommend in terms of uh, testing and quarantining once you've landed where you're going? It's not your home country, it's your destination country. Yeah. Um, we know that some countries uh, uh, may ask you to do a test even upon arrival uh, to make sure that you were not exposed during your travel or before your, your departure. And we know that some countries are asking uh, um, uh, travelers to either stay home or quarantine for 14 days. Uh, what we recommend as WHO is when countries decide to put in place quarantine measures, which we recommend for the contacts of cases, uh, these measures should be uh, following the certain uh, guidance in terms of the type of facilities where the quarantine is instituted, the access to food, the uh, distancing, and so on and so forth, and we, and we issued guidance about it. But, but uh, travelers would need to inform themselves when they travel because these measures are changing very frequently. As we mentioned before, the, the measures that countries are putting in place are based on risk assessment and they look at the evolution of the epidemics in the countries of origin, in the countries of arrival, uh, and so on. And, and the, the, the limitations or the restrictions are changing every day because of the changing and the evolution of the, of the outbreak. So, so that's why people that, that decide to travel, they need to, be, to keep themselves abreast of all these changes uh, in the list of countries, for example, from where the restrictions may be put in place and what type of restrictions they can secure and plan their um, uh, travel accordingly so that if you are asked to, to, to stay home or in your um, hotel for 14 days, you plan your travel according to, this, to these measures. And again, the message is be comprehensive. And, and look into mm -hmm. different strategies. And that's where WHO works, what we call points of entry. It's the airports, ground crossings, uh, uh, ports, and, and we try to strengthen their capacity to be able to detect a sick passenger immediately, define their contacts immediately. And also one important information WHO is suggesting is to provide all the details on what they have to do in the country they're, that they're traveling to, if that's not their own, own country, to be able to uh, refer to any medical services or provide the guidance. 
Another important, maybe very simple information is getting the passenger details. You know, mm. what is the telephone number, where, where the person is staying, so that you can reach out in case you have additional information. That's contact tracing, uh, in effect. That's part of contact tracing, to see if one of these people was a contact, if something develops later. In, in your portfolio, I mean, they're not contact yet, but yeah. if they become contact so that you can approach them because they are different than your nationals because they're mm -hmm. traveling mm -hmm. you need to know whether they stay in a certain place yeah. so that you could approach immediately yeah um, there's a there's a, a few questions asking very specific things if a person is elderly and wants to travel for holidays should they do it if uh, they're a student going into a country that perhaps has more transmission than their own country should they travel so uh, again we're talking about it's a risk assessment and a personal choice and decision in a way. I know that Dr. Mike Ryan in the press conference has spoken a lot about that, that sometimes you're even allowed to do something because it's permitted by WHO's recommendations, by your own country, but again, you can choose to, you can still choose not to travel perhaps, you could be extra, extra cautious because of your own situation, so it really um, comes to you as well to make those decisions. Where can people get information to make those decisions? Where's a, where's a good source of information for people so that, because we won't be able to answer every question here, where do you recommend people go for even more information? First of all, I think they have to really check the national uh, policies and they're all available in the reliable either Ministry of Health or the country's uh, public health institute websites. Uh, some of the countries have their own recommendations for their own citizens to travel or recommending to avoid travel. And again, the risk groups they define are different. But for us, for WHO, as we have told before, uh, we, we believe the essential travel should continue. And then people who are sick or contacts of sick people should not travel. And then there's the prevention of all the high risk group and elderly and they have to take the, to go through a risk assessment. But our recommendation is to postpone or avoid if possible. If you're in those risk groups. We also and have, there's WHO, there's material on WHO's own website. Um, so you go to who.int, there's information in, some of that information is available in all of the official UN languages. You can also go to the web page of your regional office um, or to the country page. WHO has offices in, um, 150 countries, so you could see if there's a country page that has some detailed information in the local language for you. Also check our social media platforms wherever you're watching us from now. We have information there on what kind of mask to wear, um, how to wear a mask safely, some details on travel as well. We're going to be putting out some social media slides that explain, that summarize some of what we're saying today in very um, clear bullet points to help you, to help you understand that as well. Um, there's a few questions here on um, if you are, once you arrive in the destination country, can a test, as you mentioned, uh, Carmen, if you do a test there, can that substitute for the 14-day quarantine that some countries recommend? So is the test a substitute for a quarantine is the question. We've gotten that a mm -hmm. few different times. Um, as I mentioned, it, it really depends on the, uh, on the measures, on the, on the decisions that have, uh, countries have put in place. Um, and it depends on the um, trust or confidence, rather, that the, uh, the country have in the fiability of the test themselves. So w for the moment, as I said, we don't necessarily recommend one way or the other, uh, as we want to understand more about the reliability of this test, particularly the test at points of care and so on. Uh, but uh, it all goes back to what you said of the uh, individual information and, and choices and, and uh, understanding of where they are going and understanding the measures that are in place. And just to go back to the other question, the other source of information which is um, regularly updated because of obvious and practical reasons is the airlines. And the airlines are regularly updating uh, even when you go to check if you need a visa for a certain country. There are certain services that are um, in place by our partners um, that provide the information whether in order to get a visa you need to have a test or you need to get uh, a certain other um, 
vaccination, for example, for other diseases, because it's not only COVID uh, uh, happening in the world, but all of these requirements mm -hmm. for travelers, they, um, uh, the, y there are places where people can go and get the information uh, when they decide to travel, if they need to travel, as we keep saying uh, mm -hmm. from the beginning mm -hmm. of this, uh, we'd like people to uh, avoid this as <coughs> much as possible, non-essential travel. But countries are doing that risk assessment. That's why the, the measure sometimes the countries exposed to travelers is different depending on where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. So in, in very simple terms, they feel like if the transmission is at the same level, so the traveler doesn't bring an additional risk. Mm -hmm. But if the traveler is coming mm -hmm. from a more intense transmission area, then the uh, risk of importation of, of cases are going to be uh, much higher than what is available. So, so countries have different set of measures depending where, where the individual is traveling from. But again, our message is please do all together. Yes. Do not stick to only one measure. It's, um, and that's for individuals as much as it is for countries as well, that countries should do it all. Countries should put in place the full toolbox of uh, responses that we know work against uh, COVID. The reason we know they work is countries that have implemented most of them or all of them have been successful in, in, in pushing the disease back. So it's do it all for countries and it's do it all for individuals With as well. With the intention to be able to detect any case yeah. among the travelers as soon as possible. It's the same as you would do with your nationals. Yes. Or define their contacts as soon as possible and quarantine them. And for the cases, isolate them and provide the care. And in order for the travel to not expose any additional risk, of course, what we emphasize is controlling the transmission in our countries, in the in the local setting. So once the transmission level it comes low everywhere, it's going to not go be uh, posing an additional risk. We're going to Again, that, that requires compliance at the community level, at the individual level on the measures that WHO has been recommending. So a question that's come up a few times now, we're going to be wrapping up soon, but we want to make sure you get this one. So we mentioned the filtering, I know this is getting very technical, but, but people want to know. We mentioned that the, the, the airplanes have a filtration system, and people want to know what kind of filter is that? And actually that is a detail that I've seen in our, in our communication. We said that they're, they're called HEPA filters. I don't have off the top of my head what HEPA means, but it's something related to the particles and the, the way the, the filter operates. I think operates. it's high emission particles. Yes, exactly, something. something like that. See, I said it they wasn't exactly it our area of expertise, but it is HEPA, H-E-P-A, and if you want to, you can look that up and get more yeah. information. Um, a few things, uh, we're going to be wrapping up, but I just wanted to um, express our, our sympathies to the people in Lebanon and to the people in Beirut who are affected by that terrible blast. So Rachel's working on the ground to help, but I know it's a really difficult time and all of us uh, join in, in sending sympathy to, to people and colleagues from, that, from, from Lebanon. Um, we actually have people watching from Lebanon today, as well as a few other countries I'll mention, uh, Namibia, Kenya, um, Afghanistan, Bhutan, South Africa, Egypt, Uganda, Peru, Brazil, India, France, Macedonia, and so on. From wherever you're joining, we thank you very much for joining us. Um, you must have very many, we know there are more questions than we were able to answer. Um, we will be looking at what you put in the questions and comments section. Our colleagues who um, monitor social media actually come back to us and, and let us know what kind of questions are out there and that helps um, develop what we're going to put out, what kind of answers or products we put out in order to make sure we're answering the most common questions that you might have. Um, so I just wanted to thank you one more time for joining us today. Doc thank you, Dr. Carmen Dolea. Thank you, Dr. Nedret Enerolu, for your thank time you. today. Thank you, um, Thank you for putting together the products in the first place that we're doing this Facebook uh, Live about. These were the originators of that guidance, um, working with all the other specialists that you mentioned as well and industry groups. So thank you once again. And thank, thank you. For joining thank us. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.